As always, if you haven't done so yet, please pause the video and reread the problem before listening on. We have a charge of six picocoulombs that is spread uniformly throughout the volume of a sphere whose radius is lowercase r. And in part A, we are asked to determine the magnitude of the electric field at a distance, a radial distance of six centimeters. So what we need to do is apply Gauss's law. Now, Gauss's law requires us to first select a Gaussian surface. And because our charge is spread uniformly across a sphere, it makes the most logical sense to use a spherical Gaussian surface. Now, we're going to draw a spherical Gaussian surface. It's going to be a sphere that's sort of concentric with the sphere of positive charge that we've drawn. And we're going to make sure that we draw this sphere with a radius of six centimeters. So let's go ahead and do that. We've labeled the radius of the Gaussian surface as capital R. Notice that in part A, capital R is 6 centimeters, which is going to be larger than the lowercase r, which is the 4 centimeters, and that's the radius of the sphere of uniform charge. So we just want to make sure we understand that capital R is bigger than the lowercase r. And next, we're going to mathematically apply Gauss's law. So let's consider a point located on our Gaussian surface here. Now, at that point, we're going to have an electric field. And the direction of that electric field would be pointing away from that positive charge. You may have learned in a previous chapter that if you have positive charge creating an electric field, then the electric field points away from that positive charge. So there's our electric field. And then also on our Gaussian surface, we're going to draw a so-called area vector. And what we do is we imagine that on our Gaussian sphere, we take a little patch element, I think the book calls it. It's basically a little square region. And that little square region has a particular area. And we call that little area dA. And we always point our dA area vector away from the interior of the Gaussian surface. So that's a very important remark. I'll say it again, that we must point our area vector away from the interior of our Gaussian surface. Now you can see that the little area vector and the electric field vector are pointing in the same direction. And therefore, the angle between those two vectors would be zero degrees. Now that angle will become important momentarily. And to see why, let's look at the equation for Gauss's law. So there is the mathematical formal statement of Gauss's law. And what we're going to do is start considering that integral. So we have this little constant here, and we're going to have an integral. Now we have a dot product. You probably learned in a previous physics chapter that a dot product can be written as the magnitude of the electric field, in this case, multiplied by the magnitude of that little area vector, and then times the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. Now, as noted, the angle between those two vectors is zero degrees and the cosine of zero degrees is one. So we can actually remove that cosine term because it is equal to one. Now, let us speak about the electric field at the Gaussian surface. If you go around any point on the Gaussian surface, so for example, this point here and this point there, we know that the electric field magnitude is going to be a constant value. And we know that because the charge within this sphere is uniformly distributed. So if the charge is uniformly distributed, then the electric field at any point on our Gaussian sphere is going to have a constant value. And because it has a constant value, we can actually factor it out of our integral. So now we have this little constant times the electric field magnitude and then the integral of dA. Now we have to evaluate the integral of dA. So what does that mean? Well, remember we drew that little square patch element on our Gaussian sphere, and there would be these little patch elements all around, all over the Gaussian sphere. So here and here, and just pretty much everywhere. And what the integral of dA tells us to do is to sum the areas of those patch elements. So imagine going along our Gaussian sphere and adding up the areas of those little square patch elements. And if you did that, you would end up with simply the surface area of the sphere. So the sum of all those patch elements is simply the surface area of the sphere. And we know that the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi times its radius squared. So we'll fill that in for the integral of dA. And now we're getting somewhere because we're trying to solve for the electric field. And to do that, we can divide both sides of our equation here by the epsilon constant times 4 pi r squared. And doing so eliminates those terms from the left side of our equation. 
And then at this point, it's just a matter of plugging in the known values. We know the radius of our Gaussian sphere. We know this little constant here. As far as the enclosed charge is concerned, well, let's go back to our picture. Let's look at that orange dotted Gaussian sphere. And you can see that the orange Gaussian sphere encloses the entire charge on the sphere. It encloses all of that positive charge that's located on the black colored sphere. And that charge was six picocoulombs. So that's gonna be six times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs. So let's go ahead and plug in all the known values. We've omitted units for the sake of clarity, but notice that for capital R, the radius, it was six centimeters. Right here, we divided by 100 to get it into meters. So just make sure you do that with your radius. When you calculate this electric field, you're going to get approximately 15.0, and the standard unit of electric field is newtons per coulomb. So this is the correct answer to part A of the question. In part B, we are asked to calculate the electric field once again, but we're going to be located at a distance of only three centimeters. So let's take a look at that. Now we've drawn our Gaussian surface, and this time, again, that Gaussian surface is going to have a smaller radius than in part A, because in part B, they're telling us we're calculating the electric field at three centimeters. Well, remember that, let's see, we'll write this down first. So capital R would be three centimeters, and little r was four centimeters. So basically, our Gaussian surface is located inside of that black sphere. So we've kind of zoomed in on it. Hopefully you can see that orange Gaussian surface there. Now the analysis to calculate the electric field at a location of three centimeters is very similar to how we developed it earlier. So we've basically copied the same equation, but what will change is the enclosed charge. And this is the trickiest part of part B of the question. You can see that the way in which we've drawn our Gaussian surface, it does not enclose all six picocoulombs of the charge. If you look on the outside of our Gaussian surface, you can see that some of that positive charge, some of that positive six picocoulombs is located outside the Gaussian surface. So we can't incorporate that into Q enclosed. The only thing that we can incorporate into Q enclosed is the charge that's enclosed within this region right here. So the challenge becomes to find that amount of Q enclosed, how much charge is inside a Gaussian sphere of radius three centimeters. And to do that, we're basically just going to set up a proportion. So we'll take a little bit of an aside. And here comes the proportion. We're going to say that the six picocoulombs is entirely located within that large black sphere. So the large black sphere would have a particular volume. We all know the volume of a sphere is four thirds times pi times the radius cubed. Now the radius of that large black sphere is the four centimeters. So we'll plug in 0.04 meters for that radius and then we'll cube it. So this is basically the amount of charge divided by the total volume. They sometimes call this the volume charge density. So this would be for the whole sphere. But now we're gonna equate that to the Gaussian sphere. Now the Gaussian sphere is going to have a certain amount of charge enclosed within it. We don't know that. And then the Gaussian sphere's volume is four thirds pi times its radius cubed, but its radius is only three centimeters or 0.03 meters. So this side of the proportion would just be for the G sphere. I'll call it GS, that's the Gaussian sphere. So this is a proportion that allows you to solve for the amount of charge enclosed within the Gaussian sphere. Now, of course, we can simplify this because the 4 thirds pi will cancel out on each side. So let's rewrite the proportion down here. And then we'll multiply both sides of the equation by 0.03 meters cubed. And when we solve that out, we can see that the Q enclosed is approximately 2.53 picocoulombs or 2.53 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs. So that is how much charge is enclosed in the Gaussian sphere of part B. We're now gonna take that enclosed charge, we're gonna plug everything into this equation, and let's not forget that the radius of our Gaussian sphere in part B is the three centimeters or 0.03 meters. So let's go ahead and plug everything into this electric field equation. And when you very carefully simplify that, you should get an electric field of approximately 25.3. This is Newtons per coulomb. That is the correct answer to part B. That is the electric field located at a distance of three centimeters within this sphere. And again, if you're you know, interested in the main thrust of this question, I think it was this proportion, making sure that in part B, when you calculate the electric field inside of the original sphere, that you have to first figure out how much charge is enclosed within your Gaussian sphere. And you can do that through this proportion right here. You can set the sort of volume charge density of the whole sphere equal to the volume charge density 
of the smaller Gaussian sphere because those densities are indeed equivalent. That charge is uniformly distributed. 